So it's being recorded? I think I started it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, now, now, I, now I messed you up. I'm sorry. <laughs> continue with um, mass spectrometry. So we've, we've talked a little bit about hard way where, so talking about uh, the parts of a mass spectrometer and what they do. And that, that's really useful to know those kinds of things. These instruments you're working with, they're kind of like black boxes. You put a sample in and you get something out. And the more you understand about how they work, the better you are to interpret the data. Because they can really give you garbage. And if you don't understand what's going on, you're, you're likely to accept that garbage. So like I say, it's, it's worthwhile knowing about hardware as well. So we're going to go on, though, to interpretation of data. And so in terms of identification, we've got uh, both a curse and a blessing. Today we have uh, nice mass spectral libraries here mass spectrometer set up so that you say, I want to know what this is. And you kind of put the cursor over it. It takes a look at the fragments, the mass uh, you know, display of whatever happened to be coming out of your gas chromatograph or LC right there. And it takes that fragmentation pattern and searches all through its library and says, this is the best match. It's this good, best, second best, third best, fourth best. And so that's, uh, that's like I say, a blessing and a curse. Uh, the blessing comes, it makes it pretty easy. The curse comes, it can be completely wrong. You still have to go ahead and take a look at what the machine says and say, that's really dumb, that's impossible, that could never be in my sample. And then you start looking down for what might be wrong with it. So, and actually I was at a national meeting, international meeting, American Chemical Society, and a professor from UC Davis was up talking about pineapple wine. And he identified the aroma components of pineapple wine, and he listed them, and they'd go table after table after table. It drives you nuts. But anyway, and I was looking at when he's telling us about this, and the order's wrong. Normally, you list your compounds in the order they come off your into your gas schematograph. What, how are they fed into the mass spectrometer? And he had things that I knew came before other ones. It isn't possible. So my kind of my first question was, how could you have butanol coming off your GC before methanol? You showed that in your identification. Uh, how could you have normal butanol in two places you know, in your identifications? There are no isomers of, of normal butanol. 
And he said, well, that's what the mass spec said. That was the best match. I said, that's not acceptable. <laughs> it just isn't, isn't acceptable. And so there is a danger that you take what it gives you without sitting and thinking about it. And that is, that is dangerous, and that's how we get a lot of bad things in literature that really aren't true, just not thinking about what the mass spectrometer is telling you. So we have, the, like I say, beautiful libraries that will go ahead and take, you know, fragmentation pattern like this. There's so much um, methyl groups, so much C2H3 fragments. Here's a, a parent ion up here and so on. And so we can do it that way, but again, it's also helpful if you have some understanding. If you're a good chemist, you could look at this and say, Oh, okay, 5843, that's a loss of 15, so there's a methyl group, a very fragile methyl group. It's very easily lost from this. 58, there's a limited number of compounds that can have 58. There's a um, CH2, CH3. I mean, you can look at it and you can interpret it. You can look at those fragments and through experience, you can say, I've got a good idea of what this is. It takes a, a good deal of experience and it takes a good deal of chemistry. Because, you know, another example is you'll always find a loss of 31 when it's an alcohol. So again, that's a, a nice, there's no alcohol here, so <laughs> I'm not pointing to a loss of 31. But if this were an alcohol that were, is unknown, look for a loss of 31. If it's an aromatic ring, a benzene ring, you'll see a 77, 78 for the ben benzene ring. So if you run it enough and have an understanding of chemistry, you can do a lot on small molecules to identify them too. So you do this with care. High resolution, so this just says it's a mass of 58. It's a low resolution instrument. This is your, your parent compound, 58 said. It doesn't tell you whether that 58 is made up of oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, whatever. It simply says it's 58. And so that's helpful to know, but it's not all helpful. If you actually go to an instrument that is really high resolution, I can really not just say it's 58, or I can just say it's not 28, but I can say it's 28.005. If I can get this down to three decimal places, I have an elemental formula. I still don't know how those elements are put together, but now I have a molecular weight and I have an elemental formula. So it will tell me if there's a couple nitrogens in there. It will tell me if there's oxygen and so on. So high resolution instruments are exceedingly valuable. At one time, they were like $300,000, $500,000. Now you can pick them up for 200 or less. And so things again have changed there just, just as well. So high resolution instruments certainly give you more information. They come at a cost, so you sit and say, what do I need? Can I get by with a little less expensive, low resolution instrument, or do I need a high resolution? In the food industry, you're generally going to be looking, working at uh, low resolution instruments. If you're in research, that may not be the case. Well, that's my computer assisted use care. So now we're not going to, this mass spec is generally not going to operate uh, without some being attached to some other instrument. For my business, gas chromatography, volatile compounds, aroma compounds. So basically, I'm going to hook a mass spectrometer up to a gas chromatograph. Uh, your instructor will probably be hooking the mass spectrometer up to the HPLC. So this is what feeds the mass spectrometer. And so hopefully, you know, we're getting separation of a complex mixture, kind of putting one compound at a time. And one compound at a time elutes from your machine. Then they go into the mass spectrometer and you can get, get spectra. But it's not a simple interface. It's not um, trivial in, in any sense of the imagination. It's taken a number of years to work out how we can make these instruments compatible. And one of the, the well, the biggest problem truly is we have to maintain a vacuum in our mass analyzer section. That section operates under a vacuum. And it's like 10 to the minus 6 millimeters of mercury. So it's not a trivial vacuum. It's one darn good vacuum. And so what's our mobile phase in gas chromatography? Gas, right? And one mil per minute at atmosphere is much, much volume if it's at 10 to minus 6 uh, millimeters. So that gas expands, and we have to have really better pumping. 
when you look at HPLC, you're dumping solvent into the system. That really expands when it becomes a vacuum. So we've got a, a lot of problem maintaining or a lot of issues to, to manage how we deal with this low pressure requirement. And so we've always got some kind of an interface between a gas schematograph and the mass spectrometer, the mass analyzer. So this is kind of things lined up. Our effluent from the gas schematograph goes into our ionization source, gets analyzed, detected, and of course we get uh, an output. There will always be a four pump and a high vacuum pump. It's kind of what we call a roughing pump that gets the vacuum to a certain point. Then we have really a good pump that gets us down to 10 to the minus 6 atmospheres or so. So these are, are basically the systems. Um, at this point, we've really gone to good pumping systems and capillary columns. We've gone to the point where we can actually directly connect our gas schematograph to our mass spectrometer. That wasn't the case 20 years ago. We didn't have good enough pumps. Our columns were big, bigger columns, but lots of gas flow through them, lots of mobile phase going through them. So we had to have other techniques. Today, we, like I say, directly take our column from the gas schematograph, put it into the mass spectrometer. We have to use small capillaries. We can't use medium. We can't use big capillaries. But the smaller capillaries work very nicely for us. The vacuum pump, as I said, there's, there's two different uh, pumping systems. We've got what we call a roughing pump. It gets us down to 10 to minus, 10 to the minus 4 um, millimeters. And then we go down 10 to the minus 5th, 10 to the minus 6th with the, the more modern pumps, let's say. And this is a, simply a, a turbo pump. And so this uh, turbo spins, it spins what, about 55,000 revolutions per minute? That sucker, sucker's turning. <laughs> and it does that 24 hours a day for years on end. But it basically, it takes air and it'll move it out through these plates and dispose of it. Capillary columns, well, here's the example. <laughs> um, the idea capillary column may have, a, from a gas chromatograph, may have one mil per minute gas flowing through it. That turns into 10 to the 6 mils once it gets in the vacuum. So we can pump one mil out pretty easily. Can we pump a million milliliters out in a minute very easily? Well, yes, we can through the use of these, these pumps. We need good, good vacuum pumps. So here's our system today. Basically, they're, they're interfaced. Uh, back when the mass spectrometers first came out, they occupied something like half of the, the table here. For if we go down half the row and about that width, now there's something like that wide, that tall, kind of square. Uh, so kind of a blessing. So these are really quite small today from what they, they used to be. I showed you this, so I won't, I won't bother to do that again, but it is our most powerful detector for a gas chromatograph. As I said, we can start measuring components under other components. And so we can actually not separate. That's interesting. We don't necessarily have to separate our compounds to measure, measure macroly. Because, as I said, this is our total. This is what the machine would be drawing. But if we start looking at the mass spectrometer saying, OK, what ions are increasing here? What ions are increasing here? Where do those ions peak? Where do these ions peak? You actually figure out what's moving together, what fragments are moving together. And you say, oh, these fragments moving together, they're one compound. These fragments moving together are another compound. So it's really neat. You can do quantification without separation. I, I like that. HPLC, it, there's certainly a lot more going on in HPLC than there is in gas chromatography. And that's as I, I mentioned before. For gas chromatography, it's pretty much mature. We found ways to interface these things. And so we've, we've really got a pretty compatible system, system that works well for gas chromatography. We're still getting progress, making progress in HPLC. So that area is still, still evolving. And once we get a lot of instruments that can do work for us quickly, they become much more broadly used. Once they become cheap, they become broadly used. So simply the idea 
of instruments becoming cost effective again brings them into the food industry if you're going to pay a million dollars you're not going to have many mass spectrometers in the food company believe me if you say one hundred thousand yeah we can buy one of those if they do something for us so there's a real difference and cost has been an important one as i said there's really a difference between trying to interface a mass spectrometer with an lc versus a gc carrier flows through lc are have a hundred to a thousand times the volume that we have to pump out in a gc ms system so we have a real problem with all this carrier flow liquid carrier flow going into a mass spectrometer so we do have to have some in specialized uh, systems and here are some of the systems atmospheric pressure chemical ionization called apci electro spray thermal spray particle beam the two biggest used ones or most commonly used ones are atmospheric pressure chemical ionization and electro spray they tend to be the favored methodologies uh, today this is electro spray what's uh, what's actually happening so here's our liquid chromatograph over here our liquid chromatographic column goes through its whatever and we get our effluent coming out here well actually in the, in the center so this is the effluent from the liquid chromatograph we typically have nitrogen high purity nitrogen coming along the side and we put about 4,000 volts of potential on this middle uh, connection or middle line here and that tends to spray out and so what's really happening is we put due to that 4,000 volts we put this is our droplet so this is a droplet that came out here if that makes it if that makes sense to you so make it a little bigger so we can see it that 4,000 volts charges that droplet there's a lot of molecules in this droplet and it puts a charge on the number of them and it's going to also be under a partial vacuum so in temperature so that your solvent is going to evaporate so your solvent starts evaporating and what you want to analyze keeps on getting concentrated 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 until there is no more solvent the solvent's gone and then we simply have our positive negatively charged ions that are left what we want to measure and so they get drawn in here into the machine. These positive, we have a negative charge here. It draws them into and goes into the, the mass spectrometer. So basically we put a charge on it, we evaporate the solvent, and then we set it up so that our analytes, things we're interested, go in here. The solvent gets pumped off. There's uh, simply a, hot, a, a vacuum here so that solvent gets withdrawn and typically dumped one place or another. APCI is a, a, a sim, how was it? similar but different. Yep. Do you have any like special solvents other than atmosphere? Some of the some of the yeah, there are some limitations on the solvents. That's that's right. Some solvents are easier to work with than others. Um, again, I don't do enough LC to say this is a, a good one, this is a bad one. But yeah, you're absolutely right. That does that can limit the solvents that you would would potentially use in the system. So, this is uh, APCI, atmospheric pressure chemical ionization. This is a, a useful one uh, to us. Uh, I mentioned we were we work with proteins and we do MALDI mass spectrometry. We also use this type of a mass spectrometer. In this case, we have a capillary inlet. This whole source is at atmospheric pressure, atmospheric conditions. Uh, our other one's under partial vacuum. We want to evaporate that solvent. Here, I'm drawing actually air in. So I'm drawing air, comes through here. This is like a venturi, like a water aspirator. As this gas flows through here, it sucks air into here. And this is uh, typically something like 7,000 volts when we operate this. So around 7,000 volts, whatever comes through here sits to 7,000 volts. It gets ionized, it gets drug out, and then goes into another vacuum region and your mass, mass spectrometer. 
And so this type of mass spectrometer is really good for sampling gases. You may put it into a balloon and go up into the atmosphere, look at pollution, look at upper atmospheric environment. Uh, I put it up people's nose, and so I can analyze what they just ate and what uh, chemicals, aroma chemicals, actually your olfactory region gets. So I don't actually put that up your nose, but I take the capillary that comes here and I put it up your nose. How's that? <laughs> then I give you some food to eat. I give you some orange juice and, you know, you, of course, exhale. That's how you smell the orange juice. And I sample what you just got for a stimulus that makes you say, oh, that's good or that's bad. It's really a powerful te technique to use. Mass spectra are typically displayed as a function of, of time. So here would be, you know, yep. You will get a fragmentation pattern uh, in both. Uh, you get some fragmentation. I don't know how it compares to others. You'd, you'd probably have to weigh in on that because you do LC. Okay, so there. Okay. Good, good. That's why we have at least two instructors. <laughs> so. Yep. <laughs> so I'm gonna look after the LC part. No, no, we'll look after here. And so, when you have this mass spectrometer uh, running and your effluent is coming out of some source, it's going to just simply, it's always generating ions, always measuring ions. What's coming out of, we'll stick with a gas chromatograph. And so it simply draws something that looks like a chromatogram, and that's measuring just ions that are being formed. If a lot of material, a lot of analytes coming out of the GC into the mass spec, gives you a large peak, small peak, and so on. But this, many times a second, is sampling what are the fragments? What are the fragments? So many times per second. And so we're getting just kind of a continuous uh, running of, or collection, I should say, of spectra. And if we want to know what this is, of course, we'll actually put a cursor up here, go here, and see what is this. So we can kind of look at it in different places at well, time, to make sure it is just one, one component. There's a lot of... Uh, ways we use this for quantitation. Uh, our most favorite method, but most expensive method, and sometimes, well, oftentimes, uh, sufficiently expensive that we can't, can't use it, is stable isotope uh, analysis. And this is, again, a beauty of mass spectrometry. So if we want to do stable isotope analysis, uh, we spike a sample with an isotope of what we want to measure. Now, I don't remember what we have showing. I guess this example is 5-fluorouracil. Okay. So what we would do is we, if we want to measure something, my interest would be something like benzaldehyde cherry flavor, right? A simple chemical. And so there's a stable isotope analysis. I would have someone synthesize benzaldehyde that has deuterium in it or carbon-13 in it. And so its mass would be different than what nature provided. So let's say benzaldehyde is a mass of 106. My, my radio, not radioactive, but my stable isotope might be 108. So I can program my mass spectrometer to look only at mass 106, and here will come my natural component, I'll also have it look at 108. Oh, here's what I put in to spike it. It's an internal standard. It's the best internal standard you can get is a stable isotope. Because whenever you choose an internal standard for reference in, in this type of work, you choose something that's as close to what you want to measure as possible chemically. And so what's closer, what's the closest thing to a given compound? It's stable isotope. So oftentimes you have to choose a different chemical, and then that can, that can be a problem. So the idea of generating stable isotopes, but that can be 10 grand if you want to buy one. 
and it can be a good deal of work if you want to make one. So perfect way, the best way there is to do quantification is to make, like I say, uh, a stable isotope and then use mass spectrometry to go ahead and do its quantification. And so this is uh, an example of this. This is our sample. We're going along and we're monitoring uh, our normal molecular weight. This compound has a molecular weight of 158. And so we've got our mass spectrometer. We see a peak here, we see a peak here, we see a peak here at mass 158. We put a little bit of this 5-fluorouracil in that has a nitrogen, nitrogen 15 in it. And so what we'll find is our mass of this with a nitrogen 15, nitrogen 15, is too bigger. The mass of this is 160. So my mass spectrometer goes along in real time. This part of the mass spectrometer is measuring 158. This part's measuring 160. And oops, there's nothing here. So if we know this is certain grams or parts per million or parts per billion, and this area is 10 times bigger, we know I have 10 times more of this compound. So again, we use that. We use it a fair amount, but it's limiting from a cost standpoint. If a company is doing uh, very important toxicology work, meeting government standards, whatever, that's, it's a good way to go. If you're doing a one-time deal, it's an expensive way to go. Purity of a GC peak, the mass spec. And so, well, okay. You can never be certain that a peak coming off a gas chromatograph or an LC is just one thing. I mentioned how many million compounds there are that exist in nature. How can we be certain that this peak is only that? One of the things we've monitored for in the past was benzene, benzene in food. There's a 10 part per billion standard for benzene in food. And so if you do your normal gas chromatography and you get a peak where benzene can be loots at, and it's close to 10 parts per billion in that ballpark, do you know what it is? Do you know it's only benzene? It's important to know that. You could be legal, illegal. You could face a product recall if it's over the limit. And so we always use mass spectrometry. And so we put our, our sample in, and we look and see that that peak has exactly the same fragments as from the start to the finish of the peak. There's no changing in fragmentation pattern. It's all the same, and it's all benzene. You have no other way of knowing that that compound is pure. You have no way of knowing what its concentration is, or for that matter, what it is. And that's a mistake that a lot of people make also. They really don't take the time to validate these. And that can be a tremendous threat in, in terms of data and results and liability. We have, I guess we'd call it compound uh, mass spectrometry. Um, we have the ability to do mass spec, mass spec. And in this case, uh, what we're, we're basically doing is we're going ahead, make an injection into our LC, for example. We get a peak coming out. It's taking fragmentation patterns. But some compounds will have similar patterns. And so sometimes it might be difficult that two closely related compounds will look very much alike. It'll be hard for you to say, oh, that is this compound. It's only this compound. And so what you can do is you can have a mass spectrometer that does the first fragmentation, and then it takes one of these, for example, and says, I'm not sure what that fragment is. It could be different pieces depending upon compound. It could have a different structure. And so then you can do a mass spectrum of this. So you end up getting a first mass spectrum, and you start looking at the pieces to make sure what those pieces are. And so there's a second mass spectrum that's taken. And that's a fairly common technique. And then you're really making sure that what you see is what it is. That's useful, again, when we get complex systems, complex analyses, difficult to clean up, difficult to separate. And so it's a, a powerful tool from that standpoint. And this is a, a triple quad. So now we go, um, you know, 
another step in the sense that here's uh, your first mass spectrometer, then you have a, a second mass spectrometer and a second mass analyzer. So we've really got these systems set up in tandem, and that's, uh, like I say, one of the more powerful tools that we use for quantification in looking at MSMS. In terms of applications in, in foods, um, we've had fun with it with number one, aroma release in the, in the mouth. Uh, I'll show you an example of that, of how much fun it is. <laughs> um, application, identify unknowns in food. Uh, there's a lot of things we're wondering about, we're uncertain about, we haven't identified. Assurance of purity, quality and analysis, quantification of analytes, adulteration looking for something that shouldn't be there. Again, we have just a lot of application of these techniques in the food industry. Our, um, one of our studies where we used uh, this from a flavor standpoint is we were looking at the effect of replacing sucrose with an artificial sweetener. You know, those, uh, an artificially sweetened product is, doesn't taste the same as a sugar sweetened product. They're different. Most people taste one, taste the other. Um, I particularly like the flavor, the flavor profile of high intensity sweeteners. They, they're, you know, the diet beverages, I taste a sugar sweetened, I don't care for it. It's just different. But we're about 50-50, I think, <laughs> in terms of what we prefer. But they do taste different. Why do they taste different is, is really a question that we were, we were interested in. And so, prepared three different beverages, one of the beverages had no sweetener. Another one had aspartame as a sweetener. Another had sucrose as a sweetener. And they were flavored. We put commercial flavor into the beverages and diluted. Then this is a, the example. I, I say we put a mass spectrometer up somebody's nose. Um, there he is sitting in front of a, a mass spectrometer, an atmospheric pressure, chemical ionization source. It's drawing in from his nose every time he breathes, every time he exhales, right? You ever notice that when you swallow, you always exhale? We talk about the exhale breath, the swallow breath. You always do that. You can practice and see if you can do this without doing it. <laughs> and so he takes a sip of this, swallows, and of course that's the nice fresh breath, and so air that comes out of your lungs goes right up the same path that food just took and sweeps it into your olfactory region. And then, of course, you can breathe in and breathe out again. The second time, there isn't as much material there anymore because you haven't sipped again. And every time you breathe, okay, that gets less and less and less. So the swallow breath is high in aroma. Then it's less and so on. And so this comes from the UK, Andrew Taylor's research group, who really uh, did, did work on this or got, created the whole idea. And the idea was, why do different foods taste differently? What happens when you put it in your mouth? You know, my, my comment is, if you put strawberry flavor into a rock, beautiful strawberry flavor, and you, you put it into granite, a good chemist will get that strawberry flavor out. They'll crush that rock. They will analyze it, and they'll say, there's nothing wrong with that flavor. You don't think it tastes like strawberry? I don't see why. I've analyzed it, and, and here it is. So the idea, that's kind of silly, but the idea is it has to be released. It has to be given up. A swallow breath has to sweep things up. If it all goes in your stomach, it doesn't count, right? And so this is a technique that says, okay, I put the flavor in there, but does the food give it up for smelling? And so this is what our, our data look like, and so, if you start hooking the mass spectrometer up at this point, this is acetone. That's normal in the metabolism of the body. You're exhaling acetone all of the time. And so this is when he's exhaling, so the concentration goes up. When he inhales, he's drawing room air in across the mass spectrometer. Exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale. So we keep track of your breathing pattern. At this point, he took a sip of the beverage. And then we're interested in those strawberry flavor components. Here's one flavor chemical in the strawberry, another flavor chemical, another one, another one, another one. So we're interested in how is this given up. So this first chemical, we can see it comes up very sharply. 
that breath, there's a little bit of exhale, exhale. It only lasts something like three breaths and it's gone. And that's the same for another ester, very volatile components. But some of these don't hit you immediately, they're lower on impact, but then they keep on dragging on after taste. So this is your initial impact, this balance, and this is your aftertaste of the product. And you know, we wouldn't have this kind of an understanding of what foods or how foods act and how they interact with flavor without mass spectrometry. There's no other way to do this kind of thing. And so it's really a, a fascinating uh, contribution when it comes right down to it. Uh, GC, HPLC, peak purity, that's, that's a simple one, yup. You know, take your spec across it. Is it what you think and is it only what you think? Adulteration is certainly um, a big area. Um, I guess you'll, you'll consider me a little jaded and, uh, and a little bit of um, a critic, how, how's that? Um, but my, I'm afraid I come to the conclusion that if there's a lot of money out there, there's typically somebody around who'd love to have that money, someone somewhere. And so we find adulteration occurs in the food industry a fair amount. It occurs certainly in the flavor industry. There's much more vanilla flavor, true, natural vanilla flavor sold than there are vanilla, vanilla beans grown in the entire world. And so, okay, how does that happen? You know, <laughs> you could take so many grams or so many ounces of vanilla beans per gallon and they aren't grown, so what happens? It's adulterated. Simply artificial vanilla has been put in, or artificial vanillin, the key vanilla component, is put into alcohol and sold as natural products. So the whole idea of, um, like say, adulterants come in, they're exceedingly useful to monitor. Look for things that shouldn't be there. Look for things that are modified in terms of their chemistry. We're certainly interested in, in measuring pesticides. We're interested in, in contaminants that may be in foods, in odorants that may be in food. So we really have a lot of application for this. It's interesting, of course, you can identify microorganisms uh, by mass spectrometry. <laughs> instead of plating it, instead of doing some of that work, you can actually grow a culture, take that culture, and pyrolyze it. Basically, heat it up to about 500 degrees centigrade in an instant. It gives off decomposition products that are unique to that microorganism. And so you can identify microorganisms using this, this technique. And this is where, basically explaining it, how do you get pyrolysis? How do you heat that very quickly? And this is basically the process where you can heat to different fixed temperatures in breaking down that product. Idea of protein, carbohydrate, uh, again, looking for some of these materials, and they can be in microorganisms, they can be in food for, the, for that matter. So pyrolysis, and this goes back to the, this is a, a pattern, if you take a Staphylococcus uh, aureus, you go ahead and do a mass spectrum of that, or pyrolyze it, do a mass spectrum. This is the pattern. Here's your E. coli pattern. So rather, rather interesting. MS imaging. Now, no one ever, ever thought of mass spectral imaging, doing pictures by mass spectrometry. And so this, I think, is um, the brain. Okay, go ahead and slice that brain in half. Um, You've heard of people that you say have half a brain? Well, this is how it comes about. So we take the, <laughs> uh, never mind. <laughs> so in this case, they were, they were looking at how the brain changes and it can be due to illness, can, you know, disease. It can be due to many different things, but perhaps changes are occurring in the brain. How do you know what those changes are? And again, by going ahead and, and when the animal dies or person dies, you can do cross sections of this and take slabs. And you can bombard it with a laser, give off fragments. You can actually do chemistry. You can look at the chemicals and how they change in the brain in different parts of the brain. Have they been modified? A normal brain may have a certain size of this type of, of center or so on. So again, imaging is rather, rather fascinating and can be done. Certainly the cost has come down a great deal. As I say, we used to look at a million dollars for some of our high resolution instruments. Now we're probably in the 250, 300,000 dollar. They become easy to operate, which is scary. 
because then you may hire somebody that doesn't have experience in the area and they may do these library searches. Okay, so there's a downside. But they are basically turnkey systems. Anybody can, if you can run a gas schematograph, or if you can inject a sample, how's that? If you can push a syringe down, <laughs> you can get data out of these types of systems. And so they are easy to operate. This facilitates, uh, of course, on interpretation and so on. And so we keep on seeing this advancement, making them easy to operate, getting a little better data each time. But they, they basically all depend upon someone, or it's critical that someone has a good idea of what's being done, how it's being done, and interprets their data correctly. Um, in the, the very first slide, and I don't know if that's, uh, well, we won't go there, but the very first slide has a URL to the American Society for Mass Spectrometry and a bunch of videos. If you're ever in the business, if you ever find yourself interfacing with someone or doing this, all those videos are really, really good videos to take a look at. And uh, Pam, is, 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 is the URL, is the, the new, is this on Moodle? Yeah. No, wait a minute, this is the same. It was the other one that's different, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, this is a different, the first slide is different. Okay, so let, let's be, make, yeah, so we'll make sure that gets on. If you have any, any questions, happy to deal with it. If it's today, if it's tomorrow, if it's the next year, if it's the year after, how long we go so far? But, <laughs> um, no, anyway, it, it's a fun, it's a fun, powerful tool. So I hope you have an opportunity to work with it. Do you want to? I know. Well, I always let people out early. It's just nice, nice professors do that. <laughs> I do tease her a great deal. 